I was uh, born and raised in uh, Bellingham, Washington, up in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, went to uh, school there in environmental science, which uh, quickly found me framing houses. And uh, uh, when I was 19, I did my first trip to uh, the UK, and that's when I um, really started to fall in love with beer. Um, I remember getting uh, John Smith's Bitter and uh, just being really amazed by that beer. And as I went further north, it got harder and harder to find. And, uh, and then I got to Scotland and started drinking different beers. Um, then uh, I went again when I was 21 and I uh, uh, kind of got a uh, student work visa and lived in Scotland. And uh, I really got used to the uh, British uh, kind of pub scene and culture and the beers there. And I came back home to uh, you know 80s nights and $2 pitchers. And uh, it wasn't really uh, you know what I was used to. And uh, that's really what got me into home brewing. Uh, I wanted to start uh, you know, I started making porters and stouts, and I uh, continued homebrewing for uh, several years. And um, you know, one day I was uh, working on a construction job, and uh, someone asked me to do something I didn't know how to do. And uh, they're like, you, know, "You should know this by now." And uh, it occurred to me I didn't actually intend to be doing that. And uh, my friend suggested I should be a brewer. And I, I didn't think you could just walk into a brewery and get a job. Um, so I, I did it just to show them you couldn't do it. And uh, I brought some homebrew and a resume in, and they, they hired me on the spot. So that was in, uh, I think, 2005 um, with uh, Boundary Bay Brewery in Bellingham. And I worked there for eight years. And uh, every year I applied for brewing scholarships. And then in, uh, it was 2011, uh, the Glen Hay Falconer Foundation. It's a uh, memorial scholarship named after an um, Oregon brewer, uh, Glen Hay Falconer. And uh, they provide... Uh, I think now it's four scholarships a year, uh, three through Siebel in Chicago. One of them is an international program that uh, sends a brewer to uh, Germany for part of it. Um, and then the one I got is through the American Brewers Guild based out of Vermont. So that's a six month uh, distance learning course. So it was really great. I could study while I was working. And uh, it really opened up uh, you know, my mind to uh, you know, the bigger world of brewing. And uh, you know, um, that kind of got me uh, looking uh, further out and uh, when I saw an opening at Deschutes, uh, I applied and I've been working at Deschutes for a year and a half now, um, and, uh, which is great because my, my wife didn't like the rain much in Washington, so uh, we're <laughs> very happy to be down in the, the high desert of Oregon. Um, and uh, um, as Chet mentioned, uh, so all the production brewers at Deschutes, we all have uh, secondary responsibilities. Um, so some guys, you know, they order the hops or uh, malt, and um, one of the things I do is I'm one of the several guys that works with the barrels, um, and we have a pretty extensive uh, wood aging program. We have uh, um, over 2,000 barrels in our offsite warehouse, and uh, there's a lot of uh, love and care and uh, challenges that go into transporting barrels, you know, to our production facility, to the offsite warehouse, and emptying and filling barrels. And um, we recently purchased some fooders, uh, which I think will help in the future. And uh, we're expanding our warehouse with some more barrel space. So that's uh, like the Chad mentioned the rarity of the dissident. Um, hopefully, in the future, that'll be easier to get uh, as we can increase production. Um, tell you a little bit about uh, Deschutes. Um, they opened up the first uh, Gary Fish is the owner. He opened up the first uh, brew pub in Bend in uh, 1988. And um, they, uh, it's a little tiny, uh, well, it's not tiny, but it's a 15-barrel brew house. We still use it a lot. Um, and um, then in uh, 1993, they built a 50-barrel uh, uh, production facility a few blocks away. And um, that uh, quickly outgrew that. To, uh, in 2003, we uh, added a 150 barrel brew house right next to that, our Hoopman uh, brew house. Uh, so the uh, production facility, we do you know, a lot of our mainline beers there, but uh, uh, we still use the 50 barrel brew house, the JV Northwest brew house uh, for Obsidian Stout and Abyss and, and some of our specialty beers. And then uh, we opened the, uh, another brew pub in, uh, in uh, Portland in 2008 and they have a 21 barrel brew house up there. So uh, both pubs are making their own beers all the time. And there's beers you can only get at the pubs. Uh, we do some sour beers that each pub puts beer in a barrel or several different barrels and they come to uh, us at the production facility and we blend them and bottle them. 
Uh, you only can get them at, at the pubs or the fresh facility. Does each brew house, brew house have a fooder? No, no. No, the, the fooders, we, we, we don't really have them in use yet. We just bought two and, and there's plans for more. Uh, I, I, I was just saying that, you know, for the future, uh, it's going to be a big part of what we do. But right now, our barrel program is all just in barrels. Um, and um, so all our uh, research and development, and uh, that all happens in the pubs. So a lot of the beers that uh, we produce, they started out as a, a pub beer that uh, did really well and increased production. And then, you know, it comes to, uh, comes to the rest of the world. Um, so, um, so the... Um, the mission of Deschutes is uh, to profitably de deliver the finest beers in the world and cultivate extraordinary experiences. And uh, I, I don't know if I ever worked anywhere with a mission statement before I came to Deschutes. And um, I, uh, I really, you know, uh, um, really believe in what we do there. And uh, we have uh, some really great core values of honoring our customers and delivering quality. And, um, you know, celebrating the culture of beer and building a healthy society, and it's great because the company really does what we're saying we're doing, and uh, and I really respect that. So uh, the first beer we have here is uh, Chainbreaker. It's um, a uh, white IPA. Uh, it's kind of before my time, but it started out as a collaboration with Boulevard. Uh, it was kind of the what kind of started this beer. It's I don't think exactly the same as that, but um, um, I know when we're brewing it. Um, you know, it uses uh, some malted wheat and then a lot of unmalted wheat, which is why it's really, uh, gives a lot of the cloudiness. Um, and then we, uh, we freshly grind uh, sweet orange peel and uh, coriander there in the brew house. And uh, you can smell it from like upstairs down the hall when we're doing that. It's uh, very aromatic. Um, it uses a Belgian yeast strain as a fun name, uh, forbidden fruit. Um, that uh, it's pretty interesting yeast uh, to work with. And... Um, the, uh, all the names for the beers, are, most of the names uh, of beers from Deschutes come from local landmarks. So Mirror Pond is named after Mirror Pond downtown, is a little pond, Black Butte, Black Butte Porter. Chainbreaker is named after a uh, bike race um, that happens there uh, through town uh, called Chainbreaker. Uh, Pine Drops is named after a trail. Uh, and there are some exceptions, like Fresh Squeezed is not a location in, in Bend, but, <laughs> <laughs> but most of them are, are named after. Uh, you know, things that are local to, to Bend. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know, dude, we should taste it. <laughs> have you guys had this here before? Have you guys had this before? Oh, yeah. How many people are having it for the first time? Okay, a lot. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, I was told that people would like to know all the facts about the beers, like IBUs and ABV. Is that is that true? You guys want all those? You do? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so the ABV is 5.6%. It's uh, 55 IBUs. Do you want all the calories too? or is it? No. <laughs> no? Okay. We don't want to hear the calories. I... I never want to know that either. It's no fun. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I might be able to find that. Um, uh, no, no, it's not. And we we don't filter our beer at the shoots. Uh, we do use a centrifuge. Um, and when we centrifuge Chainbreaker, um, it's a very uh, fast kind of coarse filtration. So when we obviously we want this to be kind of cloudy. We don't want to make it really bright and clear. And uh, yeah, that's a very good question. It's a, a good thing to point out. Um, and uh, in fact, I think, I don't know if you have any bottles here, but I think it has some pouring instructions that, you know, if it, uh, you might want to kind of, yeah, get everything in there. It's, it's part of how it's supposed to look and taste. And um, the, uh, the malts are Pilsner wheat and, and um, unmalted wheat, as I mentioned. And the hops uh, are Bravo, uh, Citra, Centennial, and Cascade. And then I already mentioned it's got the uh, sweet orange and coriander in it. Um, and I, I think it, it comes out really good. I mean, I've had, you know, coriander can be really strong. I don't, I don't really enjoy when coriander is like over the top. Or if it, I think anything with spices, my, my rule is if the spice is the dominant flavor, it's too much. I think anything with spices, it should, 
uh, add to the flavor of the beer, but it should never be the dominant flavor of the beer. That's my own personal philosophy. Uh, not, not that it really matters. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't make the beer. I, I, mean, I brew it, and I, I follow all the instructions. But uh, um, yeah, it's a nice, nice beer. Um, if it's okay with you guys, uh, as far as the, uh, the the pace we go through, the first three beers, uh, I know they usually do four. We're gonna do five, and I, I kind of want to go through the first three um, a little bit faster, uh, not to rush you. Don't feel like to slam your beers. Uh, I, I want to. Um, Make sure we have time to, uh, when we get to not stoic and dissident, I want you to really be able to take your time when you're drinking those beers and really uh, get into them and enjoy them. Um, so uh, if, if it does feel any point, I rush anything or skip anything, we always can go back. Um, just let me know. And, um, Are you guys ever going to can this beer or can anything or do you can? Um, there, yeah, there's, I, I don't know any plan of canning at this time. Uh, we just upgraded our bottling line just recently. Uh, I mean like really recently. We're still um, getting all the kinks out a little bit. So um, you know I think that's something maybe in the future they might like to do but uh, right now it's not on anyone's radar. Um, we just like I said we just expanded our, our bottling line. We're going to break ground on expanding our warehouse next. Um, I don't know if you saw in, in the news or online at all that uh, Deschutes is looking for a uh, East Coast facility for the future with a plan for 2019, but they haven't found a location yet that they still haven't told me. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things on the horizon for, for Deschutes, but I, I haven't heard anything about canning yet. Are they looking to build a brewery? Or yes. Or just build a brewery, yeah. And I, I know that. Um, uh, the, one of the criteria, they're, they're looking for a place kind of similar to Bend, you know, and, and Bend's a really great place because, you know, we got so much outdoor recreation all year round. There's, there's snow in the winter um, and in the summer. There's, you know, you can float the river. People move there just to go mountain biking all the time. Uh, lots of hiking. Um, I'm a terrible fisherman, uh, but the fishing there is great, so I hope that that will help me get better. Um, and uh, I, I, have, I have two little kids, and that place has amazing uh, volcanic and geological stuff all around there. Obsidian flows, you can walk through um, cinder cones, uh, lava tubes, all kinds of interesting stuff that uh, I take my kids out. We go hiking, and they, they love uh, to collect rocks. Uh, my car's full of rocks. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, they they want to find a uh, location that has a similar, you know, lifestyle as as Ben, um, and it's it's really important, you know, um, to the company that, you know, employees enjoy working there and living there, and um, you know that that's part of the criteria, and that that goes back to our core values, you know, of uh, uh, building a healthy society, and uh, so the the next beer we got coming up is uh, should be Black Butte Porter. And uh, so everybody's got that coming now. All right, and and whoa, we got one less. So Black Butte Porter is really, uh, thank you. I think uh, iconic beer for the shoots really set the shoots apart uh, early on. Um, you know, I I, th I I've been drinking the shoots beer way before I worked at the shoots, and. Uh, I know they used to be my favorite bottles to save because they had the, the hops and boss on the bottles when I was a home brewer. And um, I, I always feel like this beer really uh, exemplifies, you know, like what, uh, you know, American porter is. And, and as I mentioned before, I really got into to beer from uh, being in the UK. And I was, I was not a hop head, uh, though I've slowly mutated uh, over the years. Uh, but uh, I, I just love this beer. I always go back to this beer. Um, I never get tired of this beer. Um, it, uh, just a few things about it. Uh, I know you want the, the malts are uh, pale, carapils, chocolate, crystal, and wheat. That, that chocolate, you're going to get a lot of the, the aroma, the flavor from that, you know, the, some coffee, some chocolate. Um, but it's really smooth. It's not astringent. It's not harsh. Um, really easy drinking. Um, the, uh, the hops are uh, Cascade, Bravo, and um, Tetaneng. It's a uh, 5.2% ABV, uh, 30 IBUs. You don't want all the calories. And uh, so, um, uh, what else do I know about this beer? 
Uh, one thing I should really mention about Deschutes is that we're the second largest user of whole cone hops in the world uh, after Sierra Nevada. So it really affects uh, everything about how we, we brew our beer. Um, you know, for example, just, just to brew like uh, inversion, it takes like an hour to gather the hops because, um, you know, we have all the hops on uh, in these 210 pound bales and we have to like tear out trash cans that we're using and like pull the hops out of the bales and weigh them out. Um, takes a long time. Um, beers like uh, uh, Mirror Pond, it's, it's Cascade hops, but you know, it's multiple lots from different farms, you know. Um, and as we go through different lots, you know, the IBUs might change. Um, so one thing I really appreciate about the shoots, we have this really amazing sensory program, uh, as well as our, our micro lab. So, um, you know, a laboratory can test the ABV and the IBUs and say this beer is the same, but it could smell and taste different, right? So without people that really know a beer, that are always constantly tasting it, smelling it, um, you know, that's how we can create a consistent beer all the time because we have this really great program there uh, to do that. And uh, so I have a lot of respect for the people that, that run that um, so we can keep that beer consistent, um, you know. And uh, I don't know if this is to our horn too much with the, the Black Butte Porter. I, I, I looked up the other day, it's, it's won uh, over 25 medals and awards uh, over the years now. And um, you know, if you look up the BJCP style guidelines, um, it's one of the beers listed as an example uh, for a robust porter. And like I said, I really always felt like this is a real um, uh, good example of that, of that style. Uh, here. Oh, the, the about the 26. Oh, okay. Okay. I know that you didn't really talk about the awards too much, like the chain breaker and stuff, but I can tell you that every beer that practically that they brew has won multiple awards. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, they just put out solid beer. Everything they make is super solid and it wins awards all over the place. So, yeah. just this one. I just want to throw that out there just in case you don't talk about it later. Oh, all right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a sales guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I was asked to mention um, we have an anniversary beer we do every year. Um, so it's, it's a Black Butte, then whatever number of year it is. So uh, this last year is Black Butte 26. Uh, this next year will be Black Butte 27. And um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have that here to drink, but uh, keep an eye out for it uh, when it comes out. It's, it's kind of... Um, Inspired by Black Butte Porter, but then it's like an imperial, stronger beer. Um, and uh, a, por a percentage of it's uh, barrel aged. And then every year we do something different with it. So like this last year, um, we had uh, pomegranate molasses in it and uh, cocoa nibs and uh, cranberry puree. Um, and uh, I was involved in that one every step of the way. That was a very interesting beer to make. Uh, I, um, I know after I got the... Um, you know, we, we pump all the beer out of the bourbon barrels and uh, you get some of the charcoal out of the barrel. And we had these bags full of cocoa nibs in the bright beer tank and I had to pull them out and I had charcoal and cocoa all over me and I think I had to throw that shirt away. It was pretty bad, but uh, um, that's, it was a really delicious beer. And uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do with the 27 when it, when it comes out, but um, uh, it's, it's a, like I said, it's kind of like a big version of Black Butte Porter and it's a, our anniversary beer. I need to talk to her the, about that. I hope so. I hope you get the. I hope you get the taste. It. It's it's a great beer. Drive it down here and bring it to us. That's right. We can just avoid the distributor all right. All right. It's a nice trip. Maybe it's a field trip. Yeah. Maybe we'll go to Oregon. There you go. Field trip. We're gonna be in Bend in a couple of weeks. We'll just pick it up and bring most of it back. There you go. There's the answer. Anybody have any other questions so far? Or? Yeah, pomegranate molasses. Yeah. I mean, can you define that for me? I've never actually heard that phrase. I hadn't either until I was told to put it in the brewery. <laughs> 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 oh. oh, okay, yeah. Uh, he asked what pomegranate molasses is. And um, 
it's basically uh, like a concentrated pomegranate, but it's not like juice concentrate. It's, it's, it comes in a, it's kind of like syrup, um, but they import it from uh, the Middle East. Um, as I said, all the, all the brewers at, at Deschutes, we have secondary responsibilities. So several guys, their job is just to keep track of all our specialty ingredients. And we use a lot of them. And um, they have to order them and find them. And I, I know with uh, that one, thank you, uh, when they, um, I guess, uh, anyway, like we get um, uh, brewer's licorice from Italy for uh, BIS. Uh, so some of these things showed up at this port. and. Uh, the, the specialty guy got a call. He said, I'll come pick it up. And they said, no, you can't just come pick it up. You have to have a broker. And there's all this stuff that we didn't know, I guess. Uh, this is before my time. They just told me a story about it. I guess it's more complicated than, than they knew. Um, but uh, yeah, those guys do a great job of tracking down some of this stuff. And uh, I, I never heard of pomegranate molasses before until I used it. And um, I know when that beer's fermenting with it, um, you could just smell it coming out of the, um, the blow-off bucket on the fermenter. Uh, it was it was very aromatic. It's it's really uh, it's really amazing uh, smell, and uh, I uh, I stole some, took it home. My wife made ca uh, kombucha with it, and uh, we made some salad dressing. It was really good. Um, so, yeah. So uh, getting back to beer, uh, the ne <laughs> the next beer we have is uh, uh, it's a new beer for us at Deschutes, uh, India Red Ale, an IRA. Um, this is another one, another one of the rare beers that is not named after a location in, in uh, Bend. And, um, you know, it's, it's basically like, a, like an IPA, but, you know, red in color. Uh, the, the mold is uh, pale and then uh, Kara red and uh, black barley. So that's how it's getting that red color. And uh, the hops are uh, Millennium and Bravo uh, for bittering. And then uh, Willamette, uh, U.S. Tetaning, Crystal, Northern Brewer. And then uh, it gets dry hop later with uh, Triscoll and Summer, which were new hop varieties for me. Um, so they're, they're kind of interesting. Um, I've, I've never used them before that. And uh, Deschutes has really good relationships with uh, our, um, uh, our hop growers and, and brokers. And uh, we get to play around with a lot of experimental hops and fun things. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Um, we should taste this beer now, though. So, um, and then that kind of changes. So, for example, uh, Pine Drops uh, IPA will soon be coming out in uh, 20, or 12 ounce bottles. And it'll be here, is it, Amanda? Wh when is Pine Drops coming out here? Pine Drops is going to be released July 1st. July 1st. Right. 
but make a fall in love with something and then say, oh, sorry, can't get it. Well, we do different seasonal. That comes later. That comes on the next year. So the IRA is here and it's available, but only in draft. It's not available in And you don't have enough beer, Kathy? Yeah, they order it. It's not limited. It's just, um, it's just you can't go to the grocery store and buy it. It's okay. We all go to bars anyway. Right. It's not right. here. No, it's definitely readily. It'll be readily. We have it on draft. We'll have it on draft for a long time and no one else will ever get it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just a brewer, so I can't tell you uh, all the ins and outs of that. But there, there are some beers we do just, okay. And, and we do like seasonal nitro beers, for example. Like in the winter, we'll have nitro jubal and then nitro red chair. Um, but we have like nitro stout all the time in kegs, you know, for example. And, and they'll rotate around. And, you know, we have seasonals that rotate uh, throughout the year, right? So, um, yeah, the IRA right now is a draft only. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can get it. Yeah, you can get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's not fair, right? It's not fair to bring a beer that they can't get. Um, you're you're going to get that though at the end. The dissident um, we can't get just because it's pretty much gone. Um, but there will be more made in the future, and and when it's made, some will come here. Uh, so you know, there's some beers we only can make so much so often, especially the barrel-aged beers. I'll, I'll get right to you in a second. Um, so, uh, but it's, it, it's not, I don't think that it's like a test market thing or something or any kind of preference to certain places. Um, it's just that we only have so much that we make uh, for 28 states, you know, I think. But uh, like I said, I'm just a brewer. I don't know all those uh, details. But, uh, so, so you have another question? <laughs> all right. He had a question, then I'll get back to you. Oh. And I want Chad to listen. I, I, you have done so much so good, and it's only getting better. Um, I would like to say that we would make a great test market. Yeah. Because this place has a test market because these people are massively experienced. Mm. Of different Seriously. Yeah. That's true. Um, I, I won't argue with you at all. I totally agree. Okay. You had a question? Okay, statement. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, well, what do you, what do you think of the IRA? Did everyone's been tasting it. Good. Thumbs up. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Oh yeah, sure you can. Yeah. In our room there. Thank you. Okay, so everybody has not the stoic now. Okay, so not the stoic is a it's a Belgian quad. Um, do you need to talk a bit about that? Or uh, I, I know you guys are very educated. Uh, so uh, I'll, real quick, you know, there's different Belgian styles like Dubles and Trapels, and uh, so a quad. You know, it's kind of big, kind of stronger uh, beer. Uh, we have one we made before called the Stoic, which we're actually going to re so it's re-releasing. Before, before you go any further, will you explain the quad just a little bit more? Like, I think most people think that double, triple, quads that are really only referred to the alcohol. Yeah. Um, so explain the quad a little bit more. Yeah. And then we'll talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a misnomer. I think for a lot of people, they don't really understand the those styles. Right. No, I, I, uh, I have a hard time trying to tell people what Belgian styles are because so many Belgian beers don't really follow a uh, style, you know, they're, they're just brewing really good beer. So, um, you know, I, I don't like to try and say that, you know, this is the style and this is supposed to be this. And especially when it comes to Belgian beers, they're all so unique and different. Um, but, you know, we can kind of generalize. Um, um, but um, they, they do tend to get, it, you know, uh, a little bit stronger sometimes, you know, when you go from like a Dubol uh, to like a, when you go up to like a quad, but um, I think especially when you get to American uh, Belgian beers or Belgian style beers, then they definitely tend to 
ratchet it up. Uh, but that's not what is. That's not what it's about. Yeah, that's not. That's not what the definition of it is. But um, you know, I, I think uh, you know if you want like a, I know everybody here is always constantly d uh, fact checking everything I was told, and I don't want to try and tell you what the definition of uh, a Belgian quad is unless I had the BJCP guidelines in front of me because I'm going to say something off and someone's going to throw something at me. So um, I'm not going to step into that trap. I, I was warned, so I'm going to... Right. Right. No, I, no, I. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, no, I understand that. Um, I, I just don't feel like I'm gonna be able to give the best answer to that right now. Um, I, I haven't really like read the style guidelines for a while. Um, I, I can, I can think of like classic examples of trapels and, uh, and stuff. I could, but. Um, I guess I've already some homework for the next session. Um, so this beer, uh, went back to we we made a quad for the Stoic, which is it's actually going to come out again. Um, so not to be confusing between not the Stoic and the Stoic, um, they'll be a little bit different. Uh, so this one. Uh, it's a little bit darker in color than the Stoic. Um, it's got a Pilsner Special Bean Crystal Rye Malt, and um, the hops are uh, only Czech Saws. It's a 12% ABV and uh, 15 um, IBUs, and this has uh, some of that pomegranate molasses in it. So you might might get some of that. You're tasting it? Yeah. Okay. And oh, it's 12% and uh, 15. Um, and then we're, we're aging this 15% in Pinot Noir barrels and 15% in uh, whiskey barrels for uh, 11 months. So it was really fun. Um, when I just started working with barrels, they took me out to the warehouse and I got the taste of spear from the, the rye barrel and taste it from the, the wine barrel and it tasted totally different. Uh, and it's really, um, that's one of the perks of my job is when they taste them in the different barrels, then taste them later when they're blended together and uh, see all the different uh, pieces of the puzzle as it comes together um, and uh, I, I really wish I could like bring some of them separately for you I, that'd be really cool right and then you could chase them together but uh, uh, unfortunately to do that you kind of have to like know someone and get into the barrel warehouse uh, so you had a question in the back oh yeah the difference between stoic and not the stoic yeah um, yeah I'll finish talking about not the stoic then I'll, I'll talk a bit about the stoic because uh, it's coming out here soon, you might see it, so I wanted to talk a bit about it. Um, and then, uh, so uh, the Stoic, um, it's, I couldn't find um, the description on it, because uh, I don't have all the, mem all the recipes memorized, but I think it's just Pilsner malt. Um, there might be some two, but I have to double check. But it's definitely, you know, I've seen it, I know it's a lot lighter in color, so it won't be as dark as, as this is. Um, and it's a little bit lower in ABV. It's 11%. And, huh? The stoic? Okay, yeah, it's, it's still high. It's just a little bit lower. Uh, and then it's uh, going to be 20 IBUs. And it has a little bit more complex um, hop build of uh, Northern Brewer, uh, Hollertown Midifru, and uh, Czech Saws. And then the, the stoic will have beet sugar, uh, candy sugar, and date sugar in it. And that was kind of interesting when I saw this date sugar come in, these boxes. It's like this powder. I don't know if they like dry out dates and hammer mill them or what they do, but uh, I tried to eat some of it. It was kind of tasty, um, and uh, like, I, I taste all the stuff that we, you know, as, yeah, separate chili peppers or something. Maybe I'll just kind of smell them. But uh, um, and that um, I, I remember putting that in barrels, and we took some out of barrels recently. And it's getting blended, and it's, that is uh, 11 months in Pinot and rye, same as not the Stoic. So they're going to be kind of similar but different. You know, the the Stoic's gonna be a little bit lighter in color. 
uh, just a little bit lower in, in uh, um, ABV, but it also has these other sugars added to it uh, in the, um, the uh, kettle, and it doesn't have the pomegranate molasses in it, uh, that the, not the stoic has. So they'll, they'll be, you know, kind of similar, but they'll be, you know, pretty different too. So uh, maybe try and take a snapshot in your brain of what this is like, and then when the soa comes out, you can try and remember and compare them. Um, so uh, it'll be kind of fun. So I'll be here in June. There you go. That'd be fun. Right. Yeah. And what what I understand about oh sorry. That's a good idea. All right. Nobody buy any after class. What what I understand about the name of it? I'm sorry. I think that maybe we'll try to do that. Whatever we have left after tonight, I'll just you know we'll just save it. Okay. Sounds good. Hope I can come back. I'll get to you in a second. And real quick, the, the thing with the name was, you know, they made the stoic. And then, like I said, the pubs are always making different beers at the pubs. And someone made a, um, another, um, you know, Belgian quad is different. Um, and they're, they're mulling about names. What can we call it? You know, and someone's like, well, not the stoic. And they're like, oh, I like that. So that, as I understand it, you know, I wasn't there in the room, but that's how I understand was kind of the story with uh, not the stoic. Um, and then, so it's kind of funny. And then the, the stoic is going to come back. So it's, it's kind of confusing though. We're at work because we have them both right now. Or we just got rid of, we just got the, not the stoic out. And we have the stoic coming out of barrels. And we're talking about, you know, you have to go move the, the stoic. And you're like, not the stoic? No, no, not, not the stoic. And it, it gets a little weird. Um, so I'm going to be really happy when um, it's out of the brewery. We have to, you know, have some, it won't be confusing anymore. And uh, you had a question in the back. Thank you. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, the question was, uh, so not the stoic has a, the pomegranate molasses in it, and the stoic has the, uh, doesn't have that. Um, yeah, it's... It's not the pomegranate molasses stoic, <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it has it has the the candy sugar um, and the date sugar and the beet sugar, yeah. So what what do you guys think about it? Everyone's been oh, wow. got a little time, kind of warming up in your glass. And Training a new guy, so I didn't. I don't remember. I didn't brew any of the stoic, um, but it has the extra sugars that not the stoic doesn't have. So, you know, it'd be so much easier if we had it here to drink. Then we could really get into what the difference between them were. You know, it'd be a lot more make a lot more sense. Yeah. I, I would love to come back. Yeah, anytime you can get me the yeah out here, I would I would love to come back. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. If if this is a if this is a good time, um, I want to talk a bit more uh, just about uh, oak and uh, barrel aging and, and a little bit about that, if that's okay. Um, while we're waiting for the next beer to come out, and um, so uh, the first thing um, I want to uh, quote our assistant brewmaster of. Uh, uh, special projects, uh, Ryan Schmiege, uh, when he says uh, oak aging is an ingredient. Uh, it was on a video that uh, is on our website. And I really like that line because I, I really think it's true that, uh, 
you know, when you, when you put this beer in a barrel, it has a, a you know, really impact on the, the aroma of flavor. Um, so I, I think it's a pretty good quote. And, um, you know, the two main uh, kinds of oak we're looking at, you know, is American oak and uh, French oak. And, um, you know, uh, what I understand is the, the big difference between them is um, the, the French oak, you know, is used a lot in wine barrels. And uh, often the, the wood is uh, split. So it, it keeps the capillaries uh, still intact in the wood. And uh, often the, the wood is uh, kind of aged or seasoned for several years, which kind of uh, uh, removes a lot of the, the harsher tannins and things from the wood. And that's before they make a barrel out of it. And then after they make the barrel, um, and this goes back to the difference between a, a, a wine and a, and a bur bourbon barrel too. Um, so when they're making that wine barrel out of that, that oak, um, you know, they're kind of light, lightly toasting it um, as they're making it, as opposed to uh, American oak is a kind of, I think a hardier, tougher kind of tree. And so often they're, they're cutting or sawing the oak and um, it doesn't, it's quickly kilned and dried. So it, it has a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of the stronger flavor compounds left behind. And, um, you know, uh, the difference between the, the wine and the, the bourbon is that they're, they're very heavily charred, you know, like they just set them on fire inside, pretty much, you know, really, really heavily charred. So, uh, you know, obviously um, that gives a lot more smoke and charcoal and flavors, you know, but a whiskey can, can handle all those stronger flavors that a, you put a wine in there, it, you know, ruin it. But uh, the, you know, French oak and a wine barrel can, you know, it's much more subtle. Uh, so when we put our, our, our beer in wine barrels or bourbon barrels or rye barrels, um, you know, one main component is the type of wood. Another thing is, you know, the, the level of toast. So uh, like a, a wine barrel or French oak, um, they have different degrees of, of toast, you know, I guess. Um, and then uh, obviously the uh, bourbon are very heavily toasted um, and have the charcoal. And... Uh, the uh, also of course the uh, the previous contents of what was in the barrel is going to impact the the beer and you're putting in there. Um, we have a lot of interesting uh, different barrels. Uh, we're using that to shoots, um, you know, from bourbon and rye to wine. Um, we have some sherry pipes. I, I've seen uh, rum and cognac and uh, even tequila barrels being used for different things. Uh, and you know that. Like I said, when, uh, when I was tasting not the stoic from the wine barrel versus the bourbon barrel, I mean, those beers taste totally different just because of the barrel. It, it, it really is a major uh, component of, of the finished beer. And um, the, uh, we have the dissident coming out now. And, uh, you know, while I'm talking about barrels, uh, I talk a bit more about our sour program, too, at Deschutes. Uh, that off-site warehouse with, uh, you know, over 2,000 barrels now, it has a separate section for our sour beers, and it's a bit warmer. I'll get right to you in a minute, sir. And it has a you know, separator, so our sour beers on one side and non-sour on the other. And um, we, um, we, uh, we're going to um, try to increase the, the production of our sour beers with some fooders in the future, but um, that will be, uh, you know, it, it's developing, so I can't, like, say everything we're doing yet because it's not really, we don't need real beer and fooders yet, but we just bought some fooders and, and fooders are, if you don't know, they're like big oak tanks, you know, so. <laughs> right. No, no, they're, they're, they're closed off. They have, they have a roof to them, uh, totally enclosed. Yeah. how you can maybe do a barrel aging or what it, aging with your homebrew. And uh, there's, there's, there's several different options. Uh, 
you know, homebrew stores and supply companies online will sell cubes and uh, chips and spirals that you can, I've, I've done that at home. Um, but you, you, know, you have to be careful because, you know, there are these small chips, there's a lot of surface area. You know, for five gallons, it's really easy to overdo it. So, um, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I can talk to you more later on about, you know, maybe some things you can do with that, but you, you can experiment with that. And, oh, thank you so much. Um, and then also, uh, I'd mention uh, the, my homebrew club back in Bellingham, the, the Bellingham Homebrewers Guild. Uh, one of the guys bought a full-size barrel, and uh, 10 of us all brewed the same beer. We all did a oud brew together, and then we all put it in that barrel and aged it for a year, and then, you know, go back a year later and take it out into your keg. So maybe you join a homebrew club and you do something like that together. Uh, that'd be a good, good thing to do. Um, but let's, um, I don't want to wander off topic too much here. Um, another thing I want to mention about our barrel program at Deschutes uh, before we move to the next beer is because um, there's a huge demand right now for, for barrels and for wood because there's so many new breweries opening up and so many breweries want to do wood aged beers. And then there's already a demand for uh, American bourbon barrels and the scotch industry and, and other places. So, um, you know, we used to reuse uh, our bourbon barrels um, at Deschutes, but now. Um, after our rye and bourbon barrels are used, we sell them back to a broker and we buy all our barrels from a, a barrel broker. That'd be kind of a cool job, right? Um, and then we get new ones. So every time we're doing, uh, you know, Abyss or um, not the soak and these beers that are in bourbon and rye, they're first time use every time. So it's going to really maximize the, the whiskey impact on those beers. Um, so. Okay, so there you go. You can go get a barrel from <laughs> at Rimp. <laughs> All right. So uh, everybody has uh, the dissonant with them in front of them? Yeah? Okay. So, dissonant. I love this beer. Um, and uh, this was the one that was hard to get. Yeah. So, um, so things about the dissonant. Um, it's a... Flanders, well it's, it's a Flanders style brown ale, um, but definitely uh, very uh, American. And uh, we're using um, wild yeast in this. In uh, particular, uh, we're using uh, Britannomyces lambicus and uh, Britannomyces uh, bruxellinus in, in this, but there might also be like some uh, Decora and some other bugs and some of the barrels um, that we've uh, found before. But really what we're, we're inoculating it with Britannomyces uh, lambicus and uh, Bruxellinus. Um, and it's really fun. Um, we have a, you know, uh, a guy that, like our bug master, we call him. And um, it's, if, if I'm really nice to him sometimes, um, when he's, you know, we have some beers that are like special pub beers and they might have like four barrels of it and each one has a different, you know, it's inoculated with something different. And uh, it's really great to taste each one. Because it's the same beer, but each one might have like a different um, souring organism in them. And, and they taste so different. And then taste them when you blend them together. Um, that's, a, that's a really fun uh, experience. Um, some more about the dissident. Um, it was first made in uh, 2008, and then 2010, 2012, and then in 2014. So you see the pattern there. Um, you know, it's not made very often and in small volumes, so um, that's one of the reasons it's uh, kind of hard uh, to get, and uh, I think we're hoping to, uh, you know, ramp that up for the future so we can increase production. Um, there's a label. The, the label actually won an award at an international competition, which uh, I thought was interesting. Uh, kind of fun. Um, it's a 10.5% ABV and uh, 61 IBUs. It's uh, using Pilsner, Special B, Munich, Caramel, Crystal, and Assiduated Malt. Uh, we're using Czech Saws and uh, Herzbrucker, um, Hollertau Hops. And then we also have uh, Washington State Cherries we stick in there later on. Uh, and I can tell you that that gets pretty messy taking those back out of the tank later. That's a nice <laughs> challenge. Um, <laughs> so I haven't been able to tell it, space it yet.
<clears throat> yeah. I, I thought um, when I was talking with Amanda about this class, um, I really, really wanted to have, you know, one of our sour beers, or our non-sour beers, so that you could really see the different ends of what we're doing with our barrel age program. And um, that was really important to me that, that we had it. So um, I'm really... Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we don't have more. Um, but I hope you enjoy it. And um, I hope you know it was important to me that you get a chance to um, experience it.